Thank you very much for joining us here this evening. It's my real pleasure to introduce Dr. John Marsliff. He's the James W. Ridgway Professor of Wildlife Science in the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. Dr. Marsloff is a wildlife researcher and a prolific author, publishing an outstanding number of scientific articles, as well as 11 books and book chapters. Dr. Marsloff and his team study the relationship between humans and birds in our modern and very human-dominated world. And tonight, he's going to be telling us about crows, his research on crow behavior, and the neural mechanisms that are underlying complex behaviors that we see in this animal. Welcome, Dr. Marsla. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me, for having me to uh, talk to both the uh, academic and the public groups. It's great. And um, what I want to share with you tonight is kind of a mix of fun stories about crows that people have reported to us and then trying to understand some of that as well from uh, a neuroecological perspective. So what you see here is a New Caledonia crow. And this is a species of crow that's an expert at using tools. And it's using a piece of wire here, which is not the normal tool it would use. It would usually craft a tool from a piece of a plant to probe in and get an insect that might be um, hiding under the bark or perhaps have to craft a hook to get something that it can't get with the probe as it was trying here and unsuccessful to get this bucket of food out that it's uh, trying to get. Still working it and finally succeeding. So these animals, the fact that it can make a tool out of a piece of wire is, is kind of unique. I mean, it's not the type of uh, element it would use in the wild to craft a tool from. But um, these animals understand a problem, in this case, out of reach food, and understand how to manipulate objects in their environment to get at that food. So um, the, the fact that it's able to do that suggests to me that it has insight into this problem, understands the problem, understands what it has to do to solve the problem, and then puts into place a whole series of muscular activities controlled by activity in their brain to solve that problem. Not an easy task to do. So how do these birds, crows and, and their relatives, solve these sorts of problems? What makes them unique among birds? Um, th what this graph shows is, is three aspects of that, in, in my opinion. First, they have pretty big brains for their body size, so they have brain power. And that's shown in this graph, which is just plotting the size of the brain of an animal against their body size. And with a lot of uh, aspects of our behavior, our, the way our metabolism works, the way our body works, it's related to how big we are. Uh, and, and this I'm talking not so much within a species, but between species. And you see that here. So small fish have smaller brains than big fish. And fish in general, that's what this line is, the general relationship of fish brain to body size is below that of birds. So birds in general have bigger brains than fish. And small birds, like hummingbirds, have small brains, and big birds, like ostriches, have big brains. But the ostrich here is quite below the average bird line. So I, you think about an ostrich, kind of a pinheaded animal, right? Big body, small, small head. But it does everything it needs to with that small brain. It, it escapes predators and lives and, and has a complex life. But there are some animals that have that some birds that have quite a lot of uh, more brain than you'd expect for their body size. And these are the birds we were just talking about. So the New Caledonia crow is right here. And here's the American crow, which I'll talk a lot about today. And these birds are much more similar to a small mammal of that size. And even for our American crow, pretty similar to a small monkey of that size. So I think of these birds not as, not as flying rats, as some people uh, mentioned today, but flying monkeys. They're really, uh, they have large brains for their body size for birds uh, and, and for most of these other species. The other two things they have going for them is, is that they're social. Uh, we were just watching uh, a pair of crows out here. They're rarely alone. They are often with their pair, uh, their mate of, of a lifetime association. And um, they are even in bigger groups. You might see big flocks foraging in places or interacting with other animals. And by observing what others in your group are doing, you can learn without having to do the trial and error associated with that task. Maybe it's figuring out a new thing to eat or a new place to avoid. Uh, they can learn those sorts of things by watching one another 
uh, indirectly through social um, observations. They're also long-lived. Some of the uh, crows in, in our study are now uh, approaching 20 years of age. And they're probably crows older than that out there, but you don't know until uh, you've followed them and marked them as a young, known one or two-year-old and then follow them for their lives to see. So we know that just doing the actuarial tables for a crow that many should live for a couple of decades anyway. And certainly we've had some of our tag birds live almost that long. So long life to gather your own personal experiences, social life to learn from others, and a big brain to store and process that information. I think that's what really sets these birds apart from many, but not all. So for example, there are other large birds on here, large brain birds, and those are the macaws. So how does brain size affect the ability, in this case, to learn a task? Um, we, we trained our birds and observed our crows in captivity, uh, trying to figure out how to pull up a chicken nugget on a string from their perch. Something that all crows want to learn how to do, I can tell you that. Uh, they love chicken nuggets, and if you hang one from their perch like we did here, uh, they will try to get it. And in the first column here, birds solve this problem just by flying up and grabbing it. Kind of the, you know, the, the hammer approach. The second group, B, uh, they just broke the string and then flew down and got the food. Others stole it from the neighboring cage. But the group over in C here really learned or started to do this, and then some learned how to do a very complex way to get that food, and that is to pull the string up bit by bit and finally get it high enough that they could reach the food. And for us, that'd be pretty easy, right? You've got hands, you can just reach down and grab it, but for a bird, they have to grab it with their beak, pull it up, step on it, let go with their beak, grab it further down, pull it up, step on it again. It's a complex task. And uh, some of our birds learned how to do that quite well. And what we found was that the birds that learned it quickly, so the number of days it took to, to learn that task, somewhere in the first week, basically down here, the biggest brain birds learned it that quick, and they all learned it very quick. The birds that had smaller brains, there was a lot of variability. Some never figured it out or took weeks to do it. Others learned it just as fast as the big brain birds. So brain size has something to do with the ability to learn this complex uh, pulling task, but not everything. Obviously, there's, there are some small brain birds that are really great at it. And in crows, brain size is related to body size, uh, even within the species. So these may be smaller individuals that maybe are more motivated to get that food, for example, um, or just, just had experiences. We didn't know the life histories of these birds that we brought into the captivity. They might have been experienced with doing this sort of thing uh, in the wild, pulling up fishing lines, for example which some of these birds have been seen to do. So let me talk a little bit about the basic structure of a bird's brain, and then some of the interesting other behaviors that we've seen them do. And first off, I just want to remind you that we're all in this game together as vertebrates, uh, that we share a common ancestor, an amphibian, some 350 million years ago gave rise to modern amphibians, and then the reptiles that developed from that line sequentially gave rise first to mammals. We think of us as being the latest and greatest. We were early. And then uh, other m modern reptiles, and finally the pinnacle of vertebrate evolution, the birds. And of course, they evolved from a dinosaur-like ancestor, as we know now. But because of this common uh, ancestor that had a brain that uh, my friend Tony Angel, who's done the illustrations, the black and white illustrations you'll see here, uh, they had a brain that was uh, had the same basic parts, the same architecture for the most part as we do. A brain stem, a big forebrain or um, uh, cere cerebrum, a cerebellum that hangs down like a little melon here to kind of help control some of our motor activities and other things. And birds have those same things as well. But the outside of a bird's brain is smooth, as you can see here, relative to our convoluted and curled brain. And many people have thought that that curling of our brain and the unique structure of the cells in that part of our brain, the cortex, are what underlie our great cognitive abilities. But birds, I think, are on par with us in many ways in doing these things with a very different architecture to their brain. And some of that architecture has been recently revealed. There, you guys didn't know this, but there will be a quiz at the end <laughs> where it'll be just on the nomenclature. The important point of this slide is that there's gray up here in the forebrain of this crow. 
And what the gray is, is the part of the brain, the, the pallium it's called, and in a bird it's split up into hyper, meso, and nidopallium. That's the part of the brain that integrates complex uh, stimuli that are coming in from many different sources, the eyes, the ears, the, the touch senses, makes executive decisions about how to act upon that information, maybe combines the use of different uh, sensory inputs to make a decision. This is the thinking part of the brain. That's the part of our brain that's expanded. And in the crow, that part of the brain in particular is what is so large. Uh, and same with the parrot. The woodpeckers, for example, also have a big brain for their body size, but it's the cerebellum that's big in the, in the woodpecker's brain, not the forebrain. So maybe more motor skills versus thinking skills uh, in these birds. And there's a couple of places here just to point out to you all the amygdala and the hippocampus and the NCL. Those three things I'll talk about with some of the experiments we've done. Those are places in the bird's brain that should sound familiar, at least the first two. The hippocampus we have for spatial memory and social memory a lot. The amygdala for fear and emotional responses. And the NCL is like our prefrontal cortex or the real um, decision-making part of our brain, executive function part. So these birds act the same way we do. They bring in information from their sensory organs, the eyes, the beak for touch, uh, the ear, and that information goes to particular places in their forebrain to be assessed, to be worked on, to be integrated with other information they're bringing in. So the places that it goes here is not so important as the fact that there are distinct clusters within the bird's brain um, that's, that are centers that work on particular sorts of um, information that's being brought in. And then, of course, they form connections. Uh, these are just some schematic neurons drawn here, nerve cells that form connections among the different places in the brain to form memories. So just to point out that this is happening in the same way it does in us, the bird is making connections between things like the sight uh, that it might be seeing or the sound that it's hearing with uh, where it's been in the past. Maybe it knows this is a familiar place that always has this sound or sight and uh, the emotion that it experienced there, maybe it was very fearful or challenging place there. And then those sorts of memories might trigger responses in a motor component of the brain that, that goes and sends uh, electrical and chemical signals to the muscles uh, to eventually do something, to act upon that information. But because they're able to connect these different parts of the brain, they can have emotionally charged, spatially relevant memories that they trigger uh, when they come into a situation. And the ability to do that might help them uh, do some of these complex things like, oh, I see a food I can't get and I see a stick-like thing here. I remember that from working with a plant spear and I, I manipulate it uh, like Betty the crow did in that first video I showed you. And then one last thing, one, one last schematic of a bird's brain uh, that they do and that we do is that um, this little pathway that's shown here in the dashed arrows is a, is a loop between uh, parts of the forebrain and the thalamus here, and it makes connections that a bird, uh, a songbird in particular, can use to refine its song mentally, even while it sleeps and dreams about it, and mentally shape that um, song that they're going to give without actually singing it. Thinking about it, shaping it, so that it comes out just like it wants, before it sends a command down to that uh, motor place in the brain to go down the brain stem and act upon the muscles to make that noise. Uh, it can send that command, that think of it as an electrical code to make that song. It can send it back to the forebrain to shape it again, to change it, and then keep working and refining that before it actually sends those commands to the muscles to sing. And this is something we do all the time. We think about things before we act upon them. And that's obviously very useful for us in making decisions in our environment, how we react to things. We hear a loud blast, do we immediately run for cover? Maybe. Sometimes though we might think about it, is that really what I thought it was or is it a car backfiring? Uh, and then um, I'll keep going on my normal activity and not disrupt by sending this new command to my muscles. Well birds do that, uh, songbirds at least, and crows are, a, are songbirds a technical group of birds that have very complex throat muscles to allow them to make a variety of noises. And um, songbirds have this. Reptiles, uh, there's some evidence that they have some of these rudimentary loops. 
and uh, mammals of course do, and amphibians we don't have evidence that they do yet. So this may be part of the architecture <clears throat> of the brain and the circuitry in the brain that allows complex uh, cognitive sorts of behaviors, the refinement of things before you do them. Um, that's important to some of the things we've heard about crows doing. For example, playing. Um, you don't think of birds as being particularly playful. Maybe if you've got a parrot or a parakeet, you've seen them play, uh, and they are very playful. This is an example of two ravens that were seen in Colorado soaring on the updraft of wind at a cliff. And um, a, a couple saw this and wrote to me and said what was surprising to them was that these ravens weren't just soaring with their wings, which they're fabulous flyers. They don't need any help flying, but they were holding surfboards in their feet and using those to kind of work the wind wave as well. And, and I thought, well, why in the heck would they do that? Uh, maybe they're showing off. Again, they could be advertising their ability to carry some extra weight. Maybe they're practicing carrying things, but they don't typically carry stuff in their feet, mostly in their beaks. And uh, maybe that demonstration, though, helps them rise in their social hierarchy which is very important for crows and ravens. So there could be a variety of reasons that are functional and adaptive for them to do this, or it could just be because it's fun and something different to do. And they have the same neurotransmitters in their brain that reward endorphins, that reward our pleasant behaviors, and the birds could be getting a rush basically by doing this same thing. And I saw new evidence of this just two weeks ago in Yellowstone. I was watching the ravens were studying there and it was the afternoon, they had plenty of time to, to goof around basically, and these ravens had flown over to a slope that had snow on it, and they were picking up big chunks of ice. Much like this, they were carrying them in their feet, in their beak, they were pushing them from their feet to their beak, back and forth, they were dropping them, they were chasing each other uh, to get them and stealing from one another and just playing and having a good time in the afternoon. They also slide down uh, snowy slopes, uh, and, and again, what's interesting about this is they will slide down and get up and do it again. And there's a neat video, if you ever want to see this, of a, of a hooded crow in Russia uh, picking up a lid of a, some kind of a container, getting on the roof and sliding down with that, picking it back up in its beak, walking up to the top, sliding back down again. They play with sticks and other objects. Tug of war here is pretty common among young crows and ravens. They'll play with other animals. Uh, a lot of people have had pet crows, even though it's not legal to do that now. It was in the past. This particular pet crow uh, would pull a string for the cat that it lived with, and the cat would pounce on it. Crows understand the play bows of dogs and the actions of cats like this so that they know this is a game, this isn't a predator-prey thing, because it could be a predator-prey interaction, but the crow obviously knows that's not the case, as does the cat. Well, they take risks. Uh, and one of the risks they take is that they scold and mob, we call it, a group of them here going after a predator, a bald eagle in this case. And, and they do this regularly to red-tailed hawks and other predators that could be dangerous to them. It's been shown that by doing that, they advertise again their status. The most dominant individuals are the ones that are involved in this activity most. And they move predators away and, and give the predator the sense that there's no element of surprise here. Again, so it's not worth hunting here. And it reduces the risk to these birds that have done this. But sometimes it turns deadly, and the predator will grab the, the scolding bird in this case. They're delinquents. They play with all kinds of objects in their environment. They, they take cigarettes. It's an Indian house crow that was described taking cigarettes. They drink coffee and alcohol all kinds of things that are bad for you. And, and I wonder about this and think that a lot of it might just be they see us putting things in our mouth. These birds are observant. They're watching the people around them. Both these, well, this is a raven in Juneau, Alaska, drinking coffee. But they are uh, very observant of what we do. And perhaps this is a way they learn about new foods because they try all sorts of things. And some of them could kill them. Others could potentially turn out to be a good food. And we've also learned more recently that birds that use the filters of used cigarettes, at least, often incorporate those into their nest material, which helps keep parasites down. So maybe these birds were even experimenting with a little chemistry. They're mischievous. Uh, around here, you might see a crow pull the tail of a turkey just to get their attention, and maybe because they can, 
But I often see ravens do that to wolves, especially pups. They will pull their tails. Dogs, they'll do that to distract them so they can get their food. This is a meerkat being grabbed by an African um, raven and uh, letting out quite a yowl in response to that. Why they do that? Often it's involving food. Sometimes it, maybe it's just fun. They can do it and see the reaction on the other animal. Now this raven, whose name was Hitchcock, lived in the North Cascades National Park, which is just north of where I live in, in Washington State. And this bird was mischievous in a, in a way that was problematic for the National Park Service because it would rip off the rubber of the uh, tourist windshield wipers as they parked around the, the camping areas. And the Park Service was afraid that um, people would drive off. And you know, it, even like here, it occasionally rains in Seattle. You might have heard that. And they were afraid they would drive off and not have windshield wipers functioning and have an accident. So they asked me to come up and see if we could do something about this raven. One option was kill it, which we didn't want to do. The other was see if we can train it to do the right thing. So uh, this raven, uh, my daughter and I actually went up and we captured him. Uh, we lure them to food on the ground and shoot a gun that has a net that comes out and pins the bird down. Traumatic for the bird, I'm sure uh, traumatic. Well, in, in Hitchcock's case, rather than covering his head with a sock like we often do to calm the bird, we were a little more aggressive with him. We took him and his mate, who we caught at that time, and we put him right on the windshield of a car, looking at that windshield wiper. And while we, he was doing that, we measured his wing, weighed him, put bands on his leg to identify him, and tried to make this a learning experience that he would not want to be around these windshield wipers again because of what happened to him there. And we let him go, and, and he actually got better, and he, he wasn't a problem uh, after that. Lived for many more years there. The Park Service also helped, though, because they started giving people PVC pipe to put over their windshield wipers as they came in. So we removed the, 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 the lure and also hopefully conditioned the bird a little bit to, to leave these things alone. But because of that, he was able to live there uh, for the rest of his life. Now, as I said, crows and ravens are songbirds. They're the, the raven is the biggest songbird in the world. Uh, and because of this, they can learn to make all sorts of different noises and really have quite, uh, quite a sophisticated language. If they're raised by people, they will also uh, pick up our uh, voice like a parrot does and use that voice. And so when a friend of mine in Missoula, Montana, called to say that uh, he was uh, alarmed one morning because his dog was barking and he couldn't figure out who was you know, back there harassing his dog, he got up and he went out to his kennel in the backyard and he heard this person say, here boy, here boy, come on, let's go. He walks back, investigates it. There's nobody there, but a crow pops up right from behind the dog's handle and goes, here boy, here boy, come on, let's go. And this crow became famous in Missoula for going in the neighborhood and rounding up dogs, <laughs> calling them like this. And then the crows would follow him. He brought him to campus on, on the campus here. He's, I don't know what he's saying to them, probably sit in this case which has been demonstrated now with parrots also doing this to dogs, commanding them to sit or stay. <laughs> and then he would take off, run through the students, and our, our guess is that maybe if this wasn't just a fun game, it was potentially a foraging strategy. And so as the dogs went crashing through the students, maybe a bag of chips was dropped or something like that, and the crow could go back and get it. It lasted a few weeks, and then we haven't heard or seen the crow since. But um, quite an interesting utility of this bird to, to understand what the sounds it was making meant to this other species, dogs in this case. But since we published that uh, idea, we had, I had all kinds of email uh, from people who, oh yeah, as a kid, I remember getting called back home and I went back to my mom to see what she wanted and it wasn't mom, it was our pet crow or it was a pet raven that we had. So, this sort of ability of these animals, not only to mimic our voice perfectly, but also to use it under you know, their, own, their own desires, wishes, basically to command people or dogs or other animals to do what they want, I think is pretty interesting. Okay, so they do lots of interesting, weird behaviors, but these birds uh, also do things that have influenced us in our culture since we evolved. And just to illustrate that, what Tony has drawn here is a whole timeline of kind of some of the influences we know that crows and ravens have had on human culture. 
And again, these birds evolved several million years before we did. They were scavengers and, and compatriots with all sorts of other um, <clears throat> big predators in the world at that time, saber-toothed cats and the like. We came on the scene as hunters. We weren't very good at it. We were scavenging a lot as well, left a lot of food around. I'm sure these birds were scavenging along with us, as we see them doing in Yellowstone today, working wolves and people basically simultaneously. But because of that close interaction, their ability to, to get close to us, to, to steal from us, to challenge us as a species, we began to worship them as a creator or a trickster in a lot of our uh, coastal Pacific Northwest tribes that view the raven or the, or the crow as the creator. Um, throughout Norway and, and, and the Norseland, they, the ravens were viewed as the emissaries of the, their gods. They brought information to their gods daily. Of course, if you've been to the Tower of London, you know there are ravens that are kept there. And if they ever leave the tower, the kingdom is going to fall. So, of course, they clip the wings of the ravens to make sure they don't. But uh, that's actually a much more recent myth than, than we had once thought, probably something from World War II. In Asia, these birds influenced uh, artists there to a great extent to, to celebrate the social behavior and social flocking of these animals. And throughout that time, as they were scavengers on us uh, in battlefields after uh, early pandemics, they probably influenced things like our burial habits and, and the ways that we tended our dead. Now, they're much more symbolic of some of these things. They're scary. When you hear a crow or a raven on a movie, you know something bad's going to happen following that. Uh, they've influenced sports teams' names and rock bands and all sorts of things. They're, the word crow or raven is associated with more words in the English language than any other wild animal's uh, influence. And we've influenced their culture as they've influenced ours. When we affect them, they change their social traditions and habits, and that's a, a relationship that we have termed cultural coevolution. So the coevolution of our two cultures, uh, maybe their response to us versus our language about them, uh, and works in a similar way as the hummingbird's beak is shaped to the shape of a flower as they genetically coevolve. And, and part of that's illustrated here in this plate, which is from a membrace, uh, it's a membrace plate from a culture that existed about a thousand years ago in New Mexico. And on this plate, you see a trapper holding some nooses that he spread around the corn patch. The X's here are corn. He's spread on a fence there and he's hanging crows on that fence. And a couple of crows are walking away from that scene. All of this a thousand years ago, these uh, people that were relying upon this crop understood that if they scared the crows enough with this effigy, basically, of a dead crow, that they would learn to avoid the, the crops. But, of course, crows have learned to circumvent these sorts of things, and so we made other scarecrows. And this kind of arms race between crows getting our crops and us trying to scare them from the crops is an example of this cultural coevolution. And it favors uh, the recognition of individual people, I think, by some of these animals. And, and that's important uh, where I study crows in Washington, where they can be hunted by some people and fed by others. And crows need to navigate that variable world of human activity and learn which ones to avoid and which ones to approach. So we did a set of experiments where we tested whether they could recognize our faces. And we did this by wearing this crazy caveman mask when we captured a few birds, seven birds. And then we followed the response to seeing this mask versus a similar mask as a control to see if they would distinguish between the caveman and, and Dick Cheney, who was the vice president at the time we did these experiments. And what we found was that before we did any trapping, the birds didn't respond to uh, us without a mask or Cheney or the caveman. And after we trapped those seven birds, they responded a bit to Cheney, but um, not at all to us without a mask. And this is on our campus, I should say, similar to yours here, uh, where there's 40,000 students walking around. So they see lots of people. But if we were, wore the caveman mask, either with a hat or without it, or the, just the hat we wore during trapping, or even the face upside down, they responded strongly to us. And they responded by scolding and attacking, diving at us, basically, treating us like a predator. And the response to the upside down face is interesting because even young humans 
don't respond to their parent's face when it's upside down until they're um, several months old. But these birds, sometimes they would even turn their head upside down and look at us when we wore the mask like that. <laughs> they could recognize it. Or important features of it, because this is really quite an accentuated face. The interesting thing is that this is a culture that's developed, this response to this mask. And so if we plot the, the number or the proportion of birds we encounter that scold us when we wear that caveman mask, in 2006 is when I caught those seven birds with it, and the response was pretty strong up through the first five to ten years after we did that trapping. It started to wane a bit now, but still when I walked last week or two weeks ago now, 25% um, of the birds I encountered, so about a dozen of them that time, scolded me. And I had not done anything to them with the caveman mask for 16 years. And they still hold this uh, hate, I would say, this culture of hate <laughs> for this guy when he comes out once a year on campus. So let me talk a bit about the neurology and the neural underpinnings of some of these behaviors from our work that we've done. And I would preface this by saying I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a field biologist here trapping ravens with my colleague in Yellowstone. But uh, I've had the opportunity to work with lots of great people that are neuroscientists and students that allow us to peek a bit inside the brains of these birds. And we do this by, uh, by using a, what's called a PET imaging system to basically look at the activity where in the brain is most active under different situations that the birds are facing. So in this case, for example, we might wear different faces, maybe one we caught the birds with and one we fed them with, and we have a bird here in a cage looking out at us, and after they have had, had seen and, and done that um, stimulus, we would anesthetize and scan them and see where in the brain they were most active during this earlier time. And the way we're able to do that is kind of shown graphically here. So we catch a bird in the wild with one particular mask, in this case, take care of them wearing a different face, bring them into the lab to scan them, let them rest overnight to get used to a new setting, inject them with a, a tracer that's a, that simulates glucose, the energy source uh, in the cells and in the synapses between nerve cells in particular, um, inject them with a radioactive tracer that will stay in the part of the brain and body where most of that energy is being used and, and, and demanded from the bloodstream. And we have about 20 minutes after that injection to let the birds do something. So like in this case, open the cage, let them look out and see this masked guy. Then anesthetize and scan them to see where that radioactive um, tracer was lodged, and then after a day they've cleared that tracer, it has a very rapid half-life, and then we can let them go or put them back in the aviaries for other experiments. So this is what we saw when we let our birds look out and in one condition see the face of the guy that captured him, and in another condition see the face of the woman in this case that was caring for them. And I would say this is, the, this is the kind of imagery we see. This is analogous to a functional MRI. Shows you where the most activity in the brain is. And what you see here, here's the brain of the crow, and here's its eyes. And first off, it, it always surprises me how big the eyes are. They're actually pretty small, what you see on the outside, but on the inside, the retina that's collecting all this visual information is huge, and it's very active. The brighter the color here, the more glucose that was going there. And then these other bright spots in the brain are the visual cortex of the bird's brain, where it's assessing that information. And then over here, uh, what you see are basically the results of some statistical tests that compare one group of birds to another group of birds in, in their brain activity. And in this case, the one group saw the person that caught it, and in the uh, control group, they saw nothing in the room. So imagine sitting here, the crow looks out, he sees the person that caught them versus nobody in the room. And what we saw was the strongest activation in the part of the brain, uh, the amygdala of the crow, the right hemisphere, which if you were, if we scanned you after you looked out and saw somebody you learned was dangerous, you would also have your right hemisphere amygdala activated. In contrast, the birds that looked out and saw either an empty room or the person that had been caring and cleaning their, caring for them and cleaning their cages, 
uh, their associative reward center was activated. So they were associating that face with a meal, basically. They saw us as an easy meal. What about tool use? We saw Betty making the tool out of uh, wire. Our birds, the American crow and your fish crows, won't do that. If they ever do, please let me know. But uh, they typically don't do that. But we could train them to use stone tools, in this case dropping rocks in this tube of water, to raise the level so that it would um, allow them to reach that Cheeto. So a quick video that shows this behavior. Here's one of our birds who's learned how to do this task. And crows really like Cheetos, by the way. <laughs> you can see he wants, he wants that Cheeto bad. No, not quite enough. It's also picking up the biggest rocks. Ah, finally. <laughs> Just enough. And then it's not going to keep dropping rocks in, right? Otherwise, it would, that would also suggest that it doesn't really know what it's doing. No, it goes back in its cage. Done. And... Um, <laughs> ready uh, to go on for the next test. Um, so this is an illustration that shows now how we're going to compare the brain of those birds when they first saw the apparatus before they didn't have any training, didn't have any idea what to do with it versus later. So we catch them from the wild, we bring them into a, um, cages where they live for several weeks uh, while they're just habituating to being in captivity in a new you know, kind of lifestyle. And then we put them into the, um, to our scanning lab and we let them just look out instead of seeing the face of somebody who caught them, they just see this crazy tube with a Cheeto floating in it and rocks on the side of it. And then we bring them in, uh, we've scanned them at that point to see what their brain activity is there, bring them back in and train them now how to do that task that you just saw, which requires them to learn eventually from just knocking rocks in to knocking them that hang a little further down the tube, picking up, moving them, to finally grabbing them from the ground and putting them in. And then we take them back in the lab, let them look at that device again, and scan them at that time. And what we saw, first off, is that only four of the 16 birds that we tested could ever figure out how to do this completely. That is, pick rocks up from the ground and put it in the tube. And those were all adults that figured it out, so at least two years old and almost all females. Three of the four birds that figured out were females. I know the females are, yeah, of course, obviously. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm not surprised about the adults. As I said earlier, I was crushed by the fact that the, there were only females, really, that figured it out. But I think it has something to do with the fact that they're smaller and socially subordinate in this species. And so maybe they need to be more innovative. They need to work uh, other angles to get food, uh, not so much rely upon their brute strength to get it. But that's just an idea. What we do know is that the birds that mastered this task showed differential brain activity from those that didn't when they saw that tool the second time. So one of the areas it was activated in the birds uh, the second time they saw the task, uh, that is after they knew how to do it, and these were birds that could do it, was their tegmentum. And that's involved with motor control which makes some sense. It's a complex behavior that they have to do to, to accomplish this. But what's really interesting is that's also the part of the brain in the New Caledonian crow, the one that made the wire tool that I showed you, that is very big in that bird. And so being able to activate it and use it is apparently important to this sort of complex uh, movement. This graph is, is, shows a lot of stuff, but I'll try to make the point very simply. These are the birds that figured it out. These are the birds that didn't figure it out. And in terms of their activity after they had had their training versus before they had their training is what we're showing here. And the birds that didn't figure it out activated parts of their brain, this H, A, M, and M. Those are parts of the brain that are associated with processing visual information and attention uh, to a task. So they were looking at it. They, I think they were like, I don't know, How do, what do I do, what is this about? I still don't get this. They keep putting me in this cage to do something with this and I still don't get it. Versus the birds that could master it, their hippocampus, this uh, basal rostralis, and the cerebellum were activated. Not those places, those were activated when they didn't know what they were doing. I didn't show you those, but a new set of things was activated here. These are the places in the brain associated with memory, control of the beak, 
and other fine motor control. So this, these are birds that are acting like expert athletes that know how to do a task, and they're mentally rehearsing that task. They're relying upon what we call muscle memory to do something uh, versus inquisitiveness or trying to figure out something. So I, I use the example of a ski racer getting ready to take a run down at, say, a slalom course. And before they get in the gate to do their run, you see them kind of going like this and moving and doing everything they would normally do on the course. They're going through every gate, making every turn, expecting other bumps and things along the way. And that's what these guys are doing mentally, as far as we can tell, before they get in there and do the task. And I would say three of these birds we let go, well, we let all four of these go in and actually do it and then scan them as well. And um, three of them went in and did the task while they were in that, uh, while they were metabolizing that glucose mimic. And these two areas were even more accentuated in activity when they actually did the task. Okay, a couple more things. Um, crows have funerals. They gather around their dead and um, they scold and they have a lot of activity. And there could be a lot of things going on when they see a dead crow. One, it shows where there's a dangerous situation. But also, maybe there's some compassion and grieving going on. This might be the mate of an individual that had been with that bird for a decade or more. Maybe they're just assessing an opportunity. Hey, this one's dead. Maybe I can take the mate or I can take the territory from this one. So there's a lot of different reasons they might come in and associate around a dead bird. Sometimes these responses are pretty uh, remarkable. This photograph was sent to me uh, by a woman in Michigan who observed this crow come in and leave this piece of foil by that dead crow. And she had no idea what was going on, but my guess is that those might have been mates. Uh, and this individual was, you know, if you want to anthropomorphize, pay, paying its respects to its, to its dead mate. Or maybe it was just trying to figure out, hey, is this something I can eat? I, I don't know. But I, I kind of suspect the way this happened and how long they stood there, about 20 minutes that it stood there like that, that it was, it was something much more intense than, hey, can I eat this thing? So we have shown our crows in the lab, um, the imaging lab, people holding dead crows. So here's an example. If you're looking out of that cage as a crow in our experiment, this is what you would see. You've never seen this face, and now they're holding a dead crow, a taxidermy-mounted crow. What we saw in contrast to when they looked out and saw the person that had captured them, which again activated their amygdala, when they looked out and saw a person that they didn't know holding the dead crow, their hippocampus was activated. So they were forming a memory of this person or this place at the time when they looked out and saw that. And that could have been something that indicated danger or some other importance of that uh, person to be aware of uh, later if they ever saw him which is why you should never pick up a dead crow. If you see one, don't pick up a dead crow if there are other crows around, because that's what they'll be doing. They're forming a memory of you as being a bad thing, and you may be harassed for years, <laughs> 16 and counting, uh, after that fact. Or, you know, yeah, yeah, leave a gum wrapper and just move on. That'd probably be the better way to go. All right, so one other weird thing that crows do, uh, and we don't have any idea what goes on in their brain with this one, so just, just a fun story, but um, they sometimes leave people gifts. So Gary Clark uh, emailed me in 2006, and he said, hey, um, I really like crows. I feed them in my yard, and uh, one day I went out to feed them, and I mean, he feeds them well. He gives them whole pizzas, chickens, all kinds of things. <laughs> and uh, he went out one day and said to the crows, hey, I give you food all the time, why don't you give me something? And that afternoon on his feeder was this candy conversation heart with the word love on it. <laughs> so you hear that and you just, you kind of hope Gary never figures out where you live or, you know, that you don't deal with Gary again. But, but he turned out to be a really good guy. We met him and he showed me the other things the crows had left him, this little iron butterfly, pieces of rock and cones and sticks. And all this showed up on his feeders after the birds were there. So we have a lot of hypotheses about this. You know, maybe they understood what Gary said, and they understood what that heart said. I don't think so. Um, maybe somebody, his neighbor or his wife, snuck that thing out there after Gary was there. Maybe Gary was just lying to us. 
Maybe it was just a weird crow. It was an imprinted bird that happened to do this. Maybe, it re maybe crows really left this and it was just a mistake. They happened to be carrying a heart around and left it. Or maybe it was a way to keep Gary, to keep the pizza and chicken coming. So we went through these hypotheses and we could rule them all out. Um, I don't think they understand the spoken word. Um, certainly, I thought this was the real thing or this one, but Gary's wife's handicapped. That's all, he, he only lives with his wife. She can't get to the feeder. He's got a big fence around his yards. If, the, if his neighbors had put a heart on his feeder, I don't think it would have said love because Gary's got like 200 crows that come every morning to his yard and make a lot of noise and a lot of mess. It might have said something else. Um, and I don't think Gary was lying to us because we got, I was on the radio describing this one time and a bunch of people called and said, hey, I was sitting out on my front yard and a crow came by and dropped a red and white rocket in my lap. Another one, you know, puts mice out in his barn and the magpies, relatives of crows, leave shiny bits of glass for him. So this has been observed many times. And it's been observed in, in, uh, in my neighborhood in Seattle where this young girl, Gabby, came to my office with a truckload of things the crows had left her at her feeder, like these little flash bulbs and pencil ends and all kinds of weird things. And this is from Florida, a, uh, a bird here dropping stuff off in these people's feeder. And this is a young crow. It has a pink mouth and a brownish head. So it could be that these are young birds that are carrying things around and interacting with people in, the, in this kind of incidental way. Or uh, other examples suggest that it might be some kind of a social bonding that they have with these people, that if they, they're helped, like release, they were one situation, a bird was caught in a fence, the lady released it, and then a bird, probably the same bird, we don't know, but probably started leaving food uh, for that person, much like it would do to its social partner. It could also be adaptive. I mean, I started this journey on this question thinking, this guy's just crazy and ended up with, okay, this happens regularly, and why might it uh, happen? It could be, again, this bonding, or it could be, again, a way to uh, keep a person who's interacting positively with these birds to keep doing that. And we know that these animals are capable of these sorts of decisions that would require that kind of adaptive response. This is an experiment that was done in Germany, and the experimenter here is holding out in front of a cage of crows and ravens that are lined up. She's holding out two things, a rock in one hand and a treat in the other. And the bird has to reach out, grab the rock, take it in its cage, give it back to them, and then they get the treat. And they do that right away, especially if the treat is cheese, which they really like. Uh, if it's grapes, which is the other thing, they don't do it so fast, but they still do it. So they're attentive to knowing I have to do something to get something. And the other thing is that they are attentive to the quality of that reward. Um, and if their neighbor is just getting the treat without having to do the little rock thing, the bird in the other cage quits working completely. If their neighbor is getting cheese and they're offered grapes, they quit working as well. So they, they know the, the currency, basically, that's being exchanged here and how to get what they want. So I want to just end with uh, a thought back on these birds that they've influenced our culture. Um, we've influenced theirs. They use parts of their brain in the same ways that we use parts of our brain. And we have, a, I think, a strong connection and have had a strong connection for a long time. And yet, oftentimes, they get so abundant. Maybe there's a big roost. I don't know if you have a roost nearby here. But in one town where I live, there's a big roost that comes in. There was one in California that was in the news quite a bit uh, lately. And the people there want to get rid of the crows. What do we do to get rid of them? The first thought is, we'll just shoot them all. And that's the, the kind of typical first response. My response to that is that, let's think about that a little better. Let's try to understand why they're there. Maybe change the environment so they're not where we don't want them. And that's been done through aversive conditioning on these birds to move them to someplace else that's, from our perspective, more suitable for them to roost in. Or we could just celebrate this interaction we have. This is a great representation of it. Yeah, it's messy and it could be costly to, to some people that are there, but um, we could celebrate it. And in fact, some of these towns have done that and they have crow festivals that celebrate, you know, the crows coming into roost and they make a little money off of it. So they benefit from that sort of relationship and the crows can remain in a safe place that they've selected to sleep in. 
But just thinking more carefully about our interaction with this common bird that can often be boisterous and annoying to people, um, they have a lot more going for them than I think we give them credit. So with that, I will thank you uh, for your attention. I'm glad to take some questions. If you're interested in crow behavior, you might enjoy this little app we did, mainly for younger kids, but uh, anybody can play it where you go out and try to find different behaviors and learn about the different behaviors they do and the calls they make, what they might mean. And I would also hope that as if we could see the sunset tonight, you see a group of uh, 12 crows, because that's a sign of good luck if you see 12 crows at sunset. If you see 10,000, maybe not a sign of good luck, but <laughs> sign of something else to think about. And, and, and wonder about. So again, thank you. If you have questions, let's, let's, let's deal with them. <laughs>